Hi, Harry. Good afternoon. How are you? We're in J June 11th, I believe, of 2020. And so the world is in a different place than it was in March. And I think that we're all sort of vibrating in the best ways that we can, given the circumstances that we're that we are actually collectively living through. Yes. One thing upon another thing. Upon another thing. Yeah. And it's you it's never hard. know. You never know when the next thing is going to show up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's great to have this uh, time to sit down and talk with you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I think you and I first met when you brought students from McAllister College. Right. Um, I think it was, it was really important. Company production. It was, a, it was, I think it was a certain class and I had such, and I'll be honest, it was a large number of Jewish students. Oh. And I think the largest number in one class, it was a first year course that I ever had so intentionally. And it just made sense that they were looking for themselves. They were looking for their stories and how they're being told um, in relation to, you know, how things are intersecting in different ways and how stories are told. And I, it was, well, why aren't we going to Minnesota Jewish Theater? And it's, it's a bus ride away. <laughs> right. and, it was, and it was accessible, accessible in the sense that the theater's intimate, the stories were well done and well produced. And the conversations that we were able to have afterwards were very rich. And I Great. Think it well, that's good to hear. Years. Yes, yes. And then I had the great good fortune to uh, convince you to direct <laughs> for us, which you did a year ago, winter. You yeah, did uh, the direction on Actually by Anna Ziegler. Right. And I wonder how it was for you to direct at a culturally specific theater that looked at life through a Jewish lens. Right. Um, I have to say that for me, it was one of the most enjoyable challenges that I've had because I had to make that shift. Um, usually, especially being a black man in various sites around the Twin Cities, as well as my whole career, is that I have been sort of insider outsider, you know, being an artist, yes, but then what's the cultural community that I'm connecting with? But because this story was also connected to college students at an undergrad level, there was another way that I got to enter the experience. What I did have to make space for was there was a not, I didn't have a depth of understanding of what the Jewish culture would bring, especially for this young woman that was in the play, of what her experience would have been like, you know, entering a a college given the experience that the playwright wrote, but also in relationship to uh, a, another student of color, but then also the impact of what would be alcohol and sex and, and understandings and accusations. So there was, it was loaded with so many things that it was always um, a multi hydra headed experience of how do we manage and where do we pull from and put in the story? And also being guided by an extremely, extremely talented pair of actors. Um, I'm sure that most of your uh, organization knows Miriam Swartz, who I hear has moved to the West Coast. She's out in Portland right now, yes. Oh, okay, right. Um, and what she was able to bring, and I'm hoping that we help co you know, collectively create an environment where she was able to educate myself and the other actor with some just ways and uh, different lenses of seeing the work that we would not necessarily have been privy to had it not been in this specific cultural you know climate and yet and yet the experiences that those two characters have in the play i mean it's been a long time since i've been in college, college. but i right and and you're there and and you witness it but it seemed to me that both um, of the roles that uh, Miriam and Jacoby had mm -hmm. have so much universality to them today. Right. I think one of the things that really helped, of course, is that they're very skilled artists. Um, they had like amazing training and they had been through similar programs before. Um, so they were able to not only bring their sort of lived experience, you know, being closer to that the age of the characters, and but also understanding what those real life situations were about. 
um, there were there was a number of rehearsals that we would just have to stop and talk. It was not, we're not just, let's just not keep staging and trying to figure out. It's like, well, what's the story here? And what is your relation to this story? And space for what was uncomfortable and sometimes painful about experiencing this story that you're having to breathe, that you're having to speak. That was probably, a, 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 I would say for them, a more difficult experience because you're always looking for the best way to do it, the most, the most perfect way of engaging. And I think the fact that we, we had several, I, I call them sort of janky moments when I felt it was necessary for me to step back and let them be the middle of the, of the problem solving or at least the problem explaining. And I would say that the environment that, you know, Minnesota Jewish theater um, creates is that that kind of work can happen very intentionally oh, that way. That's great. Yeah. Well, there's so much in that script. It seems to me that it's a really tough script. It's so full of so many moments yes. <laughs> that you have to navigate right, and make decisions on. And make decisions, but you have to make them, I feel, um, as the kind of director who's also an actor, is that I really want to make sure that the actor is grounded in them so that they're understanding, they're not just sort of skipping over the surface, right. but it's like, what's the honesty? What's the truth that's in that moment? And how uncomfortable is it to work through that moment? One of them commented to me, and I don't remember who, how exhausting it was after each performance. Yes, because they have an emotional, it's, it's different than a roller coaster. It's more like a wild mouse ride. Whereas yeah. before you're turning, you're around somewhere else, and then you're making a loop, and then you're back, and then you're dropping down, and then you're stopping. And then you have to go again. Right. And once you get on the ride, you have to go. I think it was a wise choice that um, Anna did when she wrote it is that it's a one act. So that it didn't have an intermission for some, something to like pull apart and think about it. It was being conscious in the moments, but also the moments would change in time. So the actors had to do a shift into commenting on a situation that they had just been performing in, but then being in a fourth wall breaking of talking to the audience about it and then go back into it. So there was no rest. Even if the other actor was talking, you had to stay emotionally engaged with your story. And perhaps in this situation, you were also experiencing the other person talking. Well, I was so happy that you agreed to direct it. And, and you just did such a fabulous job. They, they, were, they were great. And I, I would say that one of the biggest compliments we got was Anna's um, cousin, one of her family members. I think an aunt. An aunt, thank you, came to see the show and said how much they enjoyed it than other productions. Yeah. <laughs> and so that made us really happy. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, so much has happened since we worked together and I saw right. you. Yeah. Um, I know one thing that changed in your life was, in addition to teaching theater at McAllister, you have a new role. I have a, a, I, I'm really grateful to be in this new position. I'm the Associate Dean at the Kofi Annan Institute for Global Citizenship. And one of the offerings that I get to bring is I approach issues, especially of diversity, equity, and inclusion through a theater and performance lens. So it's like, what, how do we create situations that people are able to talk and engage those topics and to think about themselves in a, themselves as how, and how they view others in uh, embracing the discomfort. Finding well, the <laughs> that's something that uh, we really need uh, a lot of at, right now. At this moment, yes. Yeah. There's um, an, another process that I've been working with called um, intergroup dialogue facilitation. And it really has to do with, in addition to myself learning how to sort of step back and away and facilitate dialogue, not just debate and discussion, but dialogue means that how are you knowing the other person and why they hold the beliefs and the the challenges that they have and them also knowing who you are and your history of why you bring that, that, that lived experience to this moment and this discussion. Mm 
So I would imagine that that creates a deeper and a greater understanding, which you can then build on. Right. And I don't think that we've, we're in a culture right now that allows a lot of that, on a, a, I mean, consciously. I mean, there's debate. It's like, here's how I'm doing, and then here's why you're wrong, and then here's why you're, you're wrong. And so that just, it builds the walls thicker and higher. And yeah. the discussion is about, I'm just going to tell you what my position is, and then I'm just going to wait until you finish, and then I'm going to tell you my position. But there's been no, in, there's, there, there's no cross pollination, right? Is, has to do right. With and, and I think you know relationships can only get better when there's a true understanding and empathy, right? And, and that's a that's a learned practice skill of and um, opportunity about empathy. I think we give it, um, we talk about it, but how do we actually practice it? Yeah, because our cultures are now so. And I want to say, I, I, I want to go, I'm, this is the one that I know we're living in the United States. Um, so our cultures are a mix, but not, they're not a melting pot. They're more a jambalaya. So that the, all the things that are in there are not necessarily understanding or being with each other. It's as if everything has gotten more disparate and more separate. So that, but we're also in this place where there are, there are those people and even institutions that are looking to how do we get back to interstitial understanding with each other. This process of doing intergroup dialogue is teaching that a lot of the things coming from identity and socialization are a large part of how we could begin the talks about shifting. But it also means inviting people into the room, into the table in a very, I don't, and I don't want to say a safe way, but in a very conscious way that this isn't an attack or a defend situation. It's about a being. Right. Well, it, it seems like it, it really is beneficial to, in a sense, structure the environment so that you can create a positive motion forward. Right. Yes. You know, and, it's, and it's not easy. No. Um, because people, I mean, yes, we are coming with our biases and our lenses and our experiences. And then how are we making them just, that's who we are, as opposed to holding, going, I'm not going to, this is, because this is who I am, I can't shift and I can't hear differently. Right. Once again, it's a practice. It's kind of, once again, it's theater. It's like rehearsal. Are we, are we, we're always in a process of rehearsing for the performance of being together. Yeah. And, there's yeah. a, there's a, I think there's a weariness. Um, I would say for those of us that are doing that work, there becomes moments of fatigue. Because oh, sure. How, I want to go, it's very similar to running a theater company <laughs> because <laughs> you're constantly balancing so many different issues and people at the same time, but still working towards this other end, which is sharing with your communities. Right. Um, but I will say, as much as um, I can attest that it can be exhausting running a theater, you're not always right in the middle mm. directly with people. And the work you're yeah. doing is, is, is right in there. Yeah. And I, I would say, it, in a, we, because we're in these particular moments, there are um, experiences and conditions that are shifting and um, affecting how you're trying to connect that you can't, you, that, that are unexpected. When yeah. someone sends out a tweet and all of a sudden the conversation and the focus all of a sudden becomes about that, as opposed to the work that you might've been doing for right. three, four weeks prior. Of course. Then yeah. You're always in a shifting mode. And that sort of, get, that's part of the, it's part of the frustration. But for me, uh, I have to say, that's part of the reason I like this work is because you have to be nimble. There's a flexibility that you need to have, not only with yourself, but with the people that you're working with so that they can be fully present, even with a discomfort that they might be feeling. Well, you know, the COVID-19 um, pandemic certainly has an effect on how we relate and what is happening in the world of theater or not uh, happening because of not, it. Yes. Then you add on just the tragic events that have come, you know, forward um, and brought to the fore, um, you know, the, mm -hmm. the tragic death of Mr. Floyd. How do you think 
I guess together they mm -hmm. will impact your work as a teacher and as an artist. Especially those two. I have to say that when we first hit the COVID-19 moment and ours was, as I always say, March 12th was the last day that I was on campus because that following week was spring break and then they knew we we're gonna have another week after that, but then no one came back to campus, but we were starting classes. So I had to immediately shift to how do I teach in these screens, in these, tri in these rectangles that are a part of how we're relating right now in people being in, in various sites literally around the country and the world, because I had international students in China, Vietnam, and Japan talk about time zones we had to be aware of. So that was the first shift. But what we found was we had to consciously agree that we're making something new, we're making it different. And once that shift was sort of collectively made, because we had already created community prior to that, we had a successful end to the, to the semester. Once that was away, and then we hit, um, George Floyd being murdered, then the, riot, then the uprisings that were literally being in the epicenter outside my window of flames going up, people running, gunshots going on. And then how, are, how do we turn that around to community healing? I still had to connect with those students in a peripheral way that allowed my own experience not to overshadow what they were going through, but to be understood as a part of, we have now shifted to a new way of communicating because the vibrations are different. So once again, using the, the themes of theater, of like you have to be honest with what you're experiencing right now, and then how do people receive that? Uh, everyone's, everyone's going to receive it differently, people are gonna respond differently. I am was fortunate that I've had two opportunities to continue to, evolve on how I'm teaching, in particular with um, the situations that we are in. I have students that we meet, and this would be the night, every Thursday night from six to nine, and we read a play. Oh. And the idea that they haven't read these plays, they know about them, like tonight we're reading Cat in a Hot Tin Roof. Oh. They just know about it, and they've been told, well, it's, not, it's part of the canon that we, that we need to decolonize. I said, but, Somehow, somewhere, you need to know what those plays are because it may be that point of view of how this writer was writing in 1952, but what, is, what was the story that they were telling and why? Because telling that story now is gonna be different. So now you're getting a perspective. So there's a way of how theater is used, being used as a, uh, a political educational tool because sure. you're understanding a sensibility that was at that time and how it's changed. But when you have a good writer, it's like, okay, well, this is also a way of structuring theatrical experiences that we can connect to in a, on a human level, but now we're in a different cultural, in a, um, a different spatial time you know, um, event. Right, um, right, they're right. Gonna, they're gonna learn something from that. Sure. They also are so, in, I say they're impacted by hearing the words. It's what theaters do is that they bring the words to life on stage. Well, here at least we're in a, we're in a place where they're hearing the words live from each other. We finished reading Angels in America and we did both Millennium Approaches and Perestroika and they were, they were overcome about how powerful it was and about how difficult it was to play these very high emotional, spiritual, political characters. So I wanna keep that alive. And if we can do it at least through this medium, I mean, this is the medium that we have. Right, I, right. I think that we can still hold on to some of the values that we really treasure in theater, which is the human experience. Well, it all begins with the text. And it begins with who's, give us some, Give us some speech. Right. Uh, speak the speech. You, you, I think, were in, was it the first production of Angels in America? I was in the premiere production, which was in San Francisco at the Eureka Theater in 1991. Was it that long ago? <laughs> yes. It, I, I, sometimes I think back and go like, wow, that, yeah, that was. And then, of course, you know, I have 
I have it here, you know, the published versions, um, which is, you know, it's fascinating for the students to realize, oh my God, you were in that. I want to go, yeah, I have a lived, once again, I have a lived experience. So I can feel it. My, my, my body vibrates on certain words, on certain scenes, on how characters are speaking. Sure. But my letting it go and letting it live in them has also been very beneficial for me because they're experiencing something, because we're talking about in the age of AIDS, and now we're in another sort of public uh, controversy and disruption about another disease. Right, right. So it's like that resonance was just timely, and they recognize that. Uh, but they also recognize how it works in different cultures because there's these judgments that we're making about the people who have whatever that disease might be. You know, I was going to say you're a triple threat in the sense that you are an actor, a director, a teacher, but it's more than that because I imagine based upon some of the work you've done, you're a singer yeah, I have to do and that. a dancer. <laughs> a movement, yes. <laughs> do you, what was the last role you performed in and do you miss performing? Uh, actually, the last role I was in was with Mixed Blood. They had a show called Autonomy that was an ex extravaganza. That yes, they, I know uh, someone that was in that Kate Fuga. Oh, yes. So and it was her was, husband, Ken's Ryden, right? <laughs> Ken's, Z Z I can never say his Is last that name. Vic? Yes, yes. Um, and it, 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 it was, it was an epic about cars and the environment and politics and immigration. Um, technology. It was very complicated. People viewed the play in golf carts that you would come to each scene. And each scene was seven minutes long and then you would have to go to the next scene and so it was continually moving. I was the last scene and I was the only character that actually spoke to the audience in their cars but I also had to sing by myself to a track and it would be like eight times in a row, eight, seven minutes. Okay, go, let's, let's do it again. And I have to say, I loved it because, you know, you, you usually do eight shows a week if you're in like a regional theater or Broadway. But it was like doing eight shows right away within the seven minutes. And then eight shows again in the next hour. And then another. So we got like 90 performances. So I really was it felt good to have the, the acting, the singing, the performing muscle again, because I think that's something that sometimes we lose when we're just teaching. Um, and, you know, quite a number of my students showed up to see, you know, me there, which was sort of, I felt really, excuse me, <coughs> sort of honored that they found time in their schedule to come, to come down. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, but it also felt good to have the theater community there. Because sometimes when you're working as a teacher, you're out of the loop of what theater is being made in the Twin Cities. And there's a lot of theater and there's a lot of um, activity and I really like being engaged with it. But when you're in higher ed, sometimes it's, it's pulling you in a different direction because there's teaching and also as the associate dean, um, and I forget, I'm an administrator as well. So I'm, I'm doing, I'm wearing a different, different hats at various times. But I find it's very useful of really grounding who I am in the theater. Because as I was telling a friend of mine today, you know, I knew that I was going to dance because that was just what I could do. I always had a big voice. Um, and I say, I, I speak like I do because I, it's my father's voice. <laughs> And I think that that's really important. And the fact that there's a human connection to stories is because I'm very nosy. I like <laughs> to know, I do, I like to know about people. Where'd you come from? What are you doing? How do you do that? And why do you do that? That's when I'm also asking every character. So when I'm working sort of as a dramaturg as well with people's scripts, because I really love working with new playwrights, it's like what's going on in each one of these moments and why? Why is, is, is this really the writer's voice? Is this a character's voice? Is this, are you trying to hit the audience with something? What does each moment mean? Which is why it needs to be powerful and specific. Um, and I think that, for example, when we did actually, it's like there was a lot of switching back and forth between why is she telling the story this way at this moment? 
so that we can know and make sense with the conversation of creating a character of who they are right now. I'm looking forward to, you know, teaching another sort of African American theater class in the fall. So I'm getting ready to use different kinds of texts to sell to tell stories over another century. I'm going to really look at the 20th century um, because those are some stories and people are telling them in different ways in different decades. So there's a political political story that also happens when you're telling human stories. It's a context. What's the I, my newest thing is what's the nest that this story what that's holding this story and how do we keep it together so that it doesn't open up and fall apart? <laughs> well, you're so busy, um, <laughs> but I know how to get a hold of you, and I'll, I'll I hope to have you back here, whether at Minnesota <laughs> Jewish Theater Company, whether it be on stage, directing, or. I've been, in your, I've, I've been at talkbacks. Um, I've been invited to come and talk about certain places. Was the theologist's wife, I think. I was on a panel um, that I was invited to Minnesota Jewish Theater, and that was, you know, a joy to be able to talk about the issues that were in the play with the audience, you know, after, after viewing it. Because I think there's a lot of, that's an important element that the theater can offer is, it's not just an entertainment, but there's something deeper and to have people speak on it right after having the experience is really kind of powerful. An I, I, audience seem to really want that. They do these days. Um, particularly with certain plays or what's going on in the world. Right. So. I, I have to say when we were doing actually, because it was about a college age situation and there were several um, universities that brought their students and it was very impactful for them to be able to talk to and with each other about what they experienced on the stage. I, I will tell you very honestly that there, I have been approached by some Title IX people at McAllister about possibly bringing at least some scenes to talk about from actually to our campus. Um, they said they wanted to, is there, is there a, scenes that I could write? And I wanna go, I think there's someone who's written it really well. <laughs> <laughs> we want to ask her permission and, you know, find out how do we compensate her, but and uh, addressing how she's telling those stories. So I think that once again, the theater has a chance to educate and, and to, you know, stimulate the conversation in really intentional ways in different venues. Right, right, right. Well, thank you so much for your yes, time today, so Harry. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to reconnect again. I see you're at home. It's a lovely, lovely space that you're probably in. <laughs> it is my house, and it is a nice, a nice environment to, to be in if I cannot be in my office. If so. you can't be in your office. Or the well, theater, yeah. Yes, well, make sure that you're taking care of yourself and get some walking in. I was doing a new thing called From the Couch to 5K. I just started today. I do try and get in a walk every day because oh, I... I'm a little hesitant to go back to the fitness center when it opens. I, I agree. I'm, 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 I can pause. I can pause there. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Have a great and glorious, glorious time. Thank you. Take care, Harry. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.